I thank you. I thank you, Madam Speaker, for allowing me this opportunity to lend my two cents to this debate on the Special Economic Zones Bill 2021. I have listened attentively to those who went before me, and in many instances, I may have repeated some of what was said, but in the interest of time and brevity, I will not rehash the items that were already discussed in some detail. But I must start, Madam Speaker, by saying I'm quite bemused, amused about the bill not being with the paper it's printed on, that we have to somehow cow to some international body so that we could get not be blacklisted. And therefore, it takes away from us the fact that the government of Trinidad and Tobago, in bringing this bill forward, is really concerned about our citizens and the benefits that is to be derived from such a bill. Saying and dismissing out of hand that it's just to facilitate some kind of um, legal requirement takes away from what I think it's a very good bill. The development of special economic zones is nothing new. Today, many developing and developing economies are increasingly utilizing SEZs as a tool to further their economic development and to move forward. My colleagues would have indicated the number of zones that exist over the world, over 5,000, and over 147 countries, and over 60,000 jobs. That, that is given. We have also spoken about the benefits to be derived by countries who adopt this particular model. And some of the benefits include infrastructure development, foreign direct investment, local investment, the development of local communities, diversification of the economy, job creation, and skills development. Schedule one of the act before us speaks towards the investors and the benefits. And I think my colleague from San Fernando East would have gone into some detail, but I'll just summarize by saying that these investors are allowed tax credits, VAT, and custom duties exemptions, reduced corporation tax, and reduced property tax. Now, I repeat these things, Madam Speaker, because very often, the layman who is sitting in his living room today and listening to us really don't understand and or care about a lot of the composition of the boards and how we, we, we frame what we want to do and how we want to do it. They are more concerned about what does this bill mean to my everyday existence? How do I benefit from the creation and implementation of such a bill? And I would like this afternoon, Madam Speaker, to deal with two or three issues that affect the average citizen with respect to how this bill is structured. And that is job creation and skill development. In part four, schedule two, again, 
those that went before me spoke towards the kinds of zones that exist and the benefits to be derived from each of those. So I won't go into that, Madam Speaker. The specific policy stroke development goals, however, can be summarized as increased economic and social impact, interconnection with other government policy, and economic diversification and development of downstream industries and job creation. There were, it was also identified the kinds of businesses that we would like to attract within these free zones. And we heard about ICTs, aviation, manufacturing, agriculture, business process. But each one of these particular subsets really requires a different approach and a different developmental standard. So for instance, Madam Speaker, if we were to deal with, say, agriculture, we know that we will need coal storage, we would need coal refrigeration and transportation, both road and air and sea. If we talk about business processes, we need reliable and fast broadband connections. If we bring in data storage companies, we know they use considerable electricity. And because they like to keep their green status, they often want energy from renewable sources. So it puts us in a place, Madam Speaker, that when we, we bring legislation like this, and we create the forum for, and for creating of good governance and putting boards and regulatory bodies and things in place, we really are doing that on the backdrop that there is some benefit to be had by the normal man in the street. The SEZs is not a cure-all, it's not a panacea. It will not change things overnight. There are challenges, and if there weren't challenges, we would not be bringing this bill today. If we were okay with what existed, then we would not be moving in this direction. I draw on the experiences of other countries who have entered into this particular realm. And I note that in Bangladesh, for instance, with the assistance of the World Bank, they have attracted nearly $3 billion in private investment, generated more than 23,000 jobs, of which 20% are held by females, and altered the industrial zone landscape in Bangladesh. Closer to home, as my friend from Point Pierre pointed out, the Jamaica experience um, showed that they had made significant strides. And under their particular SEZs, they would have created 39,000 jobs and attracted more than $1.7 billion in economic activity. Trinidad and Tobago cannot afford to linger too far behind. We must adapt to changing economic circumstances, remain relevant and competitive. And this is what this bill is about, modernizing the way we do business and how we do it. Countries to which Trinidad and Tobago has key preferential trade agreements such as Costa Rica, Jamaica, Panama, etc., all have some form of SEZs, development of their own, and will position themselves to take advantage as we must. We cannot build jobs, Madam Speaker, without developing skills. And although this particular bill deals with the 
economic um, activity and zones, this government cannot be and will not be a one-dimensional entity. So when we speak about job creations, that also goes hand in hand with skills development. And therefore, as part of our development of these SEZs, we have to create some alignment with the various institutions that we have. Alignments with NESC, UTT, UWI, other tertiary and technical level institutions to bring us and to allow us to adapt to the new and changing kinds of jobs that will become available. Trinidad and Tobago already has a highly skilled workforce. Uh, we have invested heavily in technical and vocational skills over the years. The high volumes of graduates that we have from NESC, UTT, and UWI is testimony to that. We have to involve our educational institutions in the process if we are to create the kind of changes we want to see. We need to ensure that there is appropriate training and, edu and educational institutions that are aligned with these new entities that will come into Trinidad and who will wish to set up business. We cannot sit and expect that we know what they need and therefore it has to be a collaborative effort. We also need to understand, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that one of the issues of setting up SEZs is that of sustainable community development. With a focus on SECs being placed on locations outside of the already established economic hubs of the two largest cities in Trinidad and Tobago, Port of Spain and San Fernando, more communities will benefit from the economic development through the development of many SECs. Decentralization of economic activities means many would have greater opportunity for employment closer to their home and communities of origin, reducing the rural-urban pull. Rural communities such as mine, Mr. Deputy Speaker, could benefit tremendously from a well-oiled, well-greased, and well-run SEZ mechanism. I have no doubt that the bill as drafted and no doubt there will be changes during the committee stage, but I'm confident that the bill as perceived will in fact bring the benefit that we expect to Trinidad and Tobago, to our citizens, to our young people, and to our communities. And I have no, and I stand here and offer my unreserved approval for the mechanism out, as outlined by the Ministry of Trade and Industry and the Minister. And I thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, for giving me this opportunity. And I look forward to the fast and easy passage of this bill. Thank you.